Okay, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Ad Hoc River Committee, a special meeting, February 28th. Uh, unfortunately, we will not be joined by Councilor Labange or Councilor Wissar, uh, but I always appreciate their support when they do come. And um, today should be a relatively short session. Um, March will be essentially uh, rescheduled to April, to anticipate April to have, have a, a longer meeting, a more substantive meeting. That's April 25th. I'll repeat that during the announcements. But to begin, um, we have with us um, Friends of Los Angeles River uh, to speak to us on that number one. So, Mr. CLA, can you, or someone, who reads into the record? One of you guys, right? <laughs> read this into the record as uh, you come on up to the microphone. Give us your name and address. Formal presentation by Folar relative to river access. So it's about river access, presentation by Folar, Friends of the LA River. And that was, I believe, is Louis McKenna and Charles Eddy, correct? That's right. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to say briefly a little bit about how this thing came about. Um, we felt that uh, there needed to be the basic fun the fundamental principle of this is that why you, you don't need a permit to go to the beach why do you need one to go to the LA River and so we began to we decided to be more positive than that and put together a set of recommendations for how one access to the river and a, kind of a broad ish, number of issues and we brought together a committee of uh, basically lawyers uh, one of them, Peter Weinberger, sitting there as a litigator. Uh, and we, there was probably six lawyers, including uh, uh, Sean Hecht from UCLA Environmental Law School, Morgan Lewis from a downtown law firm who's a specialist in water law, um, uh, Jan Chatton Brown and Doug Carstens, you, you know, and Charles. Charles basically led this committee and uh, he's, uh, he's no, no longer a practicing lawyer and when we found that out we gave him a whole new thing to do and uh, he's taken it up amazingly and so he's really the person to talk, that I want to talk to, I want to, to hear talk about this thing and, and we're basically going from agency to agency to talk about uh, these access issues and how they could be solved uh, if they if everybody would just listen to what we say and uh, so I will uh, leave it now to uh, Charles Eddy to lay out just the simple what we've done and why thank you Mr. Eddy and uh, welcome I'll do this if the move the microphone a little bit closer to you that would okay be yeah I need to uh, I'm having a little trouble getting the uh, slides We need an engineer. <laughs> Sorry. Huh. You know, I'm going to. Uh, let me swap out my computer. Wasn't it working just a moment? Oh, it wasn't plugged in. Oh, that's the audio. No rebooting. Does this feel this like is part, I of, tell is some part of this? Is, is this one of the budget issues that yeah. uh, you're dealing with? We just have to go out the old fashioned way. Pull out the Excellent. pad and the, <laughs> the tripod, and, yeah. and we're done. There it is. Oh, perfect. Ta da. I was in the laptop with this connection. Ah, thanks. What, was really, what really drove us, um, as Lewis said, September of last year, we put together a team of uh, environmental and water attorneys, river experts, and uh, other river-oriented organizations and users who've come together a number of times since then and have assisted in looking at the whole access and use question. And what we really wanted to get at is what is the meaning of, uh, what, what's the meaning of US EPA's traditional navigable water designation in July of last year for the public's use of the river? Um, it raised, it addressed some fairly clear issues, raised a bunch of other ones. So went through a process of interviews and research uh, which is work still in progress. Um, some of these legal issues are uh, a little tricky. Some of them are uh, uh, really cases of first impression. We don't have you know, definitive answers, but we've come to some, I think, preliminary answers which are uh, 
quite positive, and we've used these to develop essentially policy, not not uh, legal uh, recommendations. Okay, can I and can I ask you a question before you go any further? Sure. And this is more from a devil's advocate point of view. Is um, we know it's a river, and that's what we're trying to make everyone else realize. But we also know that it behaves as a flood control channel. So when, and what struck me, uh, Lewis, is when you said, well, you, we, we don't need a permit to go to the beach, but we do need for a permit for the river. And what echoes in my mind are the fire uh, department, paramedics, safety issues and how we engage the river mm-hmm. and making it safe. So just in that context, if we could, if you could help me as we answer these questions, making sure that we don't lose sight of that reality of, of the flood control and, and its dynamics. And so it will help me out as we go through this. Absolutely. We, we, yeah. we looked at it in that context, as you'll see. Right. And uh, that's um, uh, we clearly need to proceed right. in, in that way. Uh, the, the traditional navigable waters decision, in the narrowest sense, meant that the LA River and its tributaries are subject to Section 404 and others of the Clean Water Act. That's a fairly narrow uh, view. That's just if the developer wants to put a golf course into Hunger Wash, he's going to have to go through the 404 process. Um, but we think it's much more than that. Uh, because the way the, the way the decision's written is that in, in the eyes of the federal government, and I think it's equally applicable to the state, is a nav- it is a navigable river, not just a flood control right. channel. And it does raise all these issues of trade-offs. Right. Um, we've found that's not totally unique. There are rivers such as the Kern, which where the flow is controlled by releases from a Corps of Engineers dam. So the safety issues are in part related to how the uh, flood controls are managed. We're investigating, and one of the things we're proceeding with is to look at several other uh, rivers around uh, the country where there have been similar situations. Um, And I think particularly of note, and and if you read the backup for the EPA decision, they relied uh, very heavily on past and future public recreational uses of the river in their determination. They go back to Chumash days, uh, not necessarily that they were using it for recreation, but they were were navigating on the river, um, and they re- relied very heavy, heavily on the, the role of the city and the city's master plan. Um, the decision, the fact that it is now a navigable water, brings into play some legal doctrines which were potentially applicable before, but now we think are much more clearly applicable, the public trust doctrine. That goes back to uh, the Code of Justinian. <laughs> and uh, through English common law, it comes to us today. It was the basis of the uh, California Supreme Court decision that uh, preserved Mono Lake and required all the actions on the city in the part of Mono Lake. It's been used quite extensively in California and a number of other states. Um, it creates government obligations with respect to access and use of the river. We think, it, we think it elevates the responsibilities above what they might have been before, not just for the city, of course, but for other agencies. There are provisions in the California Constitution applicable to, to rivers, to navigable rivers, with the terms of access and use, which, which now clearly apply. And there are other federal navig- navigability standards uh, which involve California, uh, which also would be applied. But the bottom line, we believe, is that it must be managed for public uses as with any other navigable uh, river. Uh, We think the city's in a stronger position than it was before to advance its leadership role uh, for public use, and the city has its own uh, very strong rights in history. We now add to that the use of the public trust doctrine, the strong assertion of uh, ownership rights in the river and the riverbed, which are embodied in the municipal code, um, and the Pueblo Doctrine, which is a uh, an interesting piece of history uh, going back to uh, a series of California and U.S. Supreme Court cases in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, which basically said that whatever rights were in the Pueblo of Los Angeles at the time the Spanish grants created it, adhere to the city, and the courts have found that the Basically, the city owns the river. Um, And I think that's the basis for the provisions that have ended up in the municipal code. Most of that had to do with water use rights as opposed to the ownership of the bed and how you 
use the riverbed, but um, they are still, it's still with us today. It's never been overturned, and it's actually quite a strong precedent in terms of strengthening, I think, strengthening the uh, city's position. Uh, what we tried to do was, in a, in a survey, and not in any formal survey way, but we tried to identify the principal uses um, that are occurring on the river, uh, whether they're currently allowed, whether a permit's required, uh, and our recommendations for future use. And we later on in the report you have expand on the recommendations. Um, I don't think it's necessary to go through these in any detail. I did want to point out, if you look at most of whether it's currently allowed, we come up with this, uh, the two words, policy unclear. We're not, you know, not sure. Uh, people get cited for fishing, usually they don't. People get cited for boating, sometimes they don't. There's not much of that, but uh, I don't know anybody's, I hike and bird in my section of the river, and I've never had a problem, but other people I've talked to have. So I think this notion, as we went through this, of uncertainty that needs to be addressed as quickly as possible is a major, a major piece of this, and I think you know, what you're doing with the, uh, with the voting committee is a uh, definite step forward in that regard and right. look forward to continue to in some way be involved with that. And unfortunately, it's happening at a time when we, the city's having a uh, historic struggle with resources and <laughs> staff time, and uh, staff is demonstrating Herculean efforts with all the challenges. So we are struggling, but we are also pushing forward. Well, as we conclude in the report, to the extent that you know we might be able to be of help, or we can put people together and you know kind of agree on general principles and then, and provide some support, we you know we'd like to be able to do that. So that's, that's and I would uh, appreciate that very much. Um, just to reiterate, I mean uh, policies aren't clear and they can be inconsistent. Um, and it's also frequently unclear whether or not a permit's required, and sometimes even when a permit is given by one agency, it may not be recognized by the other agency. We've run into that several times recently. Our overall recommendations for the longer term, a policy of open public access and use of the entire river, compatible with safety considerations. That's the longer term. We realize that you know that's gonna be uh, resource intensive, intensive, budget intensive. But we do believe in the near term, uh, simply recognizing the current realities and focusing on those sections of the river that are already used quite extensively uh, will get us uh, a substantial way. And, and what we're suggesting is basically the creation of three recreational use zones. Uh, Sepulveda Basin, Glendale Narrows, Elysian Valley, and the uh, estuary at Long Beach. You know, this constitutes 12 to 15 miles, depending on what's included, or nominally about 20% of the river. So it, it's a manageable piece in areas that are already used and where there are already issues that have to be uh, addressed. Um, and what we would hope to see is, is a coordinated effort with the city, the core, uh, LA County Flood Control and the City of Long Beach um, and we're briefing all of these agencies on this report uh, um, to develop a, a comprehensive set of policies, perhaps a memorandum of understanding, some other vehicle uh, for going forward. Uh, but we do feel it's critical not to lose the momentum from the TNW decision and we feel this, to, in order to not lose the the impetus we have from the EPA decision of last year, we ought to try to accomplish as much of this this year as possible. Um, we've thought that perhaps the LA River Cooperation Committee, which uh, I know the city's playing a major role in moving that forward, might be a vehicle for doing this. Uh, maybe it could be its primary agenda for this year uh, as one possible uh, means of, of moving forward with possible with uh, recommendations. Okay. Uh, those are general recommendations. Um, in light of what you just raised, um, Councilman, the, the, the question of use, user safety is, is obviously critical. Uh, it's, it's, it's not your, not your usual river in, in many senses, and in other senses it is. And it's, it's, it's uh, 
I'm a longtime kayaker, and this looks very safe compared to some things I've been on. And and I, but I can see where the risks are, and and how and how all and all the issues that have to be managed. Um, but there are two notions that have come up that we think need to be addressed. One is uh, the dry the dry season wet season distinction. Uh, we don't think that's particularly realistic. Uh, you get a month like January, which is absolutely no precipitation at all. People flock into the river, uh, but there isn't any system. They, they get confident and suddenly February comes in and the river's a high hazard level again. Um, any, also anything which we've seen in a couple of agency statements that anything that might involve any water contact is prohibited or not advisable. We don't think that that's particularly realistic either. Um, so our general feeling is that the current policies don't really address the risks in a way that's useful and protective uh, for the public, and it may create artificial senses of security in some sense. Uh, we have normally 30 to 35 rain days a year, which means that 90% of the, the year is dry. So in and around that, the river looks like it does most of the time. Uh, it's used year-round, use is increasing, uh, policies which prohibit use I think are going to be very difficult if they're you know, absolutely prohibitive are going to be unenforceable and, and aren't going to be successful. What we'd like to see, and this came from a number of people that were worked with our group, uh, is to have some kind of a year-round safety and warning system combined with improved education. Um, we have some more detailed recommendations in the report, but generally we we're talking about a visual warning system, perhaps a red flag system in the principal access points, uh, relatively low cost, um, perhaps a, um, uh, and at that type, you know, X days before and X days after a rainfall event, uh, the river is basically closed. Uh, and red flags are up, and anybody but ignores them is clearly ignoring them at their own risk. There's nothing comparable right now. There are a few signs, and I know that areas where they close the bike path, open the bike path, close the horse trails, open the horse trails, uh, though I've noticed those signs tend to stay up rather than down sometimes. It's, you know, there is a little maintenance issue there. Uh, a second major thing we'd like to see improved is signage, uh, and uh, it's, it's often non-existent. It can be confusing. Uh, there's no uniformity. Uh, we went out and looked at all the signage in the Elysian Valley and the, and the Sepulveda Basin. Um, there's really nothing to inform the user. Uh, this one particular example uh, is an anti-loitering ordinance, and, and this, this appears along a couple of sections of the bike path in the uh, Glendale Narrows. I haven't seen it in other locations. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's an anti-camping uh, type of uh, control. I think it's also a reflection of the, um, the invisible population that is the homeless. Yes, uh, I think that's what... Because there's a little, you know, I see whole families in there at, you know, in certain I mean, instances, and and they are essentially sleeping there, they're living there. And uh, I think that is a, a challenge that we have as a city. I, I, I think it's, uh, I think that's the intent, but uh, we've had other users who have uh, showed us their tickets and they're ticketed for anti-loitering, for fishing, and for other activities. So it, it's, the first part is pretty clear. If I read that and didn't read the last couple of words, I'd say, yeah, this is, we don't want people sleeping in the bottom of the river. Uh, but uh, this last or remain or loiter in the official bed of the LA River. That you know, I, we think it's being used a little more broadly than it was intended um, for enforcement purposes. And uh, when I was taking this picture, people came up and asked me what this was about. And I, you know, I begged, I begged ignorance. But but this is one. This is actually the only prohibitory sign that uh, we were able to find in the Glendale Narrows Elysian Valley area. So otherwise it was, you know, any of the, any one, any of the entrances, you really didn't have any particular uh, uh, signage. Um, keep your dog on a leash and a few things like that. But we would, 
what we'd like to see is a commitment to installation of basic and uniform signs uh, as early as possible. Uh, at least at the main entrances, signs that show the accepted uses, the prohibited uses, uh, any restrictions uh, due to health and safety concerns. Uh, fairly simple, not, not signs, not, not the long list of don'ts you have, but some, you know, welcome to the LA River, here's what you can do, here's what you shouldn't be doing, and here's where you can go for some additional information. We've had discussions about beefed up websites that would uh, provide, provide this information. Uh, ideas on education, and you know, FOLAR has had educational programs for a number of years, and I think we're in a position to beef some of these up now and continue them, but uh, uh, there are other, probably other opportunities, but uh, having a single go-to website where people can get as much information about access points, parking, what they can do, uh, and so forth would be a, a substantial improvement that could even be posted on the signs and be available for potential users. Um, encouragement expansion of the school programs and educational tours uh, by facilitating access for these, for these groups. And this, uh, uh, there have been some issues. I don't know if you want to speak to that with educational tours, but uh, we, we, need, we need to have clear policies as to what they can do. And uh, If I got into that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's safe to say that, you know, I mean, Lupe probably knows this, but the last time Jenny Price did a tour, she had a permit or a letter from the Corps of Engineers, an LAPD car, black and white, showed up. Jenny pulled out the letter from the Corps in a sort of aha moment and handed it to the guy, the policeman. And the policeman said, this doesn't have anything to do with me, and handed it back. And in truth, it really didn't. It was really a letter saying, uh, don't blame us if anything goes wrong. And, you know, so that's, you know, and that's, that's the level. I mean, the police was very perfectly nice, but we had, Jenny had 60 people there that had to leave, leave the river because the police guys were standing there next to their car. I mean, that's just what, you know, and she'd waited four and a half months to get that letter. Right. And then when she got it, which was like 12 hours before the thing, the police ignored it kick people out. And I was there, I saw it. Which segues really to the last main point here, which, which is permitting and enforcing and enforcement. And, um, you know, permitting is non-transparent. Uh, there's a question, there's always a question of who you're going to get the permit for, who's in charge. Uh, enforcement is highly ad hoc. A uh, number of agencies involved, it's inconsistent. Some people were cited someplace for a particular activity. They're not cited at another location. We've interviewed fishermen. We've interviewed other users. Uh, it, it, sometimes it seems almost like harassment. Other times the rangers will go right by them and won't say anything. So there's this, uh, it's like my dog off leash in Griffith Park. It's the same issue. <laughs> Sometimes the rangers ignore it once they didn't. Um, but all of this, we think, needs uh, a really hard look. Uh, we, think, we, we think the permitting is, is appropriate when the size and the nature of the activity uh, uh, demand that conditions be set and that, and that the agencies know what's going on. We, we, you know, large groups, they need to be advised. Um, in Lewis's example, which is a good one, uh, the, the, basically the core letter says, uh, well, okay, this is okay with the core, but you really need to get approval from the city. When she's taking the tour out the next day, she hadn't gone to the city, and I don't know that the city has a permitting process per se. Um, and so uh, a, a simple to use transparent process, perhaps with an application form online and maybe a single desk that people can go to, uh, whether it's city, county, or uh, the core that coordinates the permitting would certainly, uh, with, with some timelines on when a permit has to be approved. Um, but de definitely with clear guidelines. Uh, and, and a similar recommendation for enforcement, that the various enforcement agencies 
in some way come together and understand what the other ones are doing and what they're enforcing for. That actually obviously has to work back into what the policies are to start with because if you're going to be prohibitory in one particular sense, uh, then it has to be uniformly uh, enforced. Um, and, and again, to get there we think you need to have the enforcement based on delineated permissible activities which show, show up in signage in the education program so that people understand what they can and they can't do. If they still elect to do something that's prohibited, then that's their risk. Um, and we think with the right combination of these, we can deal with the, you know, the unusual nature of the, of the river. It, it's, it's, uh, it, it does has to have to be handled a little differently than, than right. say, putting a kayak in the Hudson River. Right. So I'm not sure that the L.A. River was not his higher risk than the Hudson, but... Uh, <laughs> I think that's a part of the season. And I truly appreciate this body of work. Um, we've been um, trying to be methodical in how we create an environment that establishes the type of awareness that it's just a basic right to visit the river and enjoy it. And having the necessary amenities that allows us to enjoy that experience is, where, is what we are trying to achieve. But like you've said, we've got the county involved, we've got the Army Corps, we've got the city, and we've got the Toronto Water Power, we have Union Pacific, and those are the five main bodies that tend to have an influence on how we get in, how we get out, where do we park, is it safe, is it not safe, their operations, so it's, it's pretty complicated as you well know. What I do appreciate about this is that it gives us, um, and, 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 and what I hear are the echoes of the master plan, that we have certain nodes that we want to focus on. And the three areas, at least the two areas in the city, overlap the nodes that are highlighted in the master plan. And so how we evolve and create policy to, to have that interaction that achieves that experience is, is what we're trying to, to get to. Um, I think your offer to work on basic policy language, uh, how we can move on on verbiage that allows us to address some of the legal issues is uh, very much appreciated because we might need your assistance there and how we put together this, this body of information. But um, I have some recommendations I'd like to make um, unless you have questions of me or any other statement that you'd like to make. No, I don't no? think so. The, for the chance to, yeah, you know, we, to we really a uh, yeah. chance to discuss it further, or however you would. Uh, well, this is this is. Let me state the recommendations, and then I'll get your response to that. Uh, first, I'd like to direct the CLA to draft the motion supporting targeted recreational zones, so that begins to formalize uh, these uh, pockets, if you will, of, of opportunities, and stimulating that river experience. Uh, also, uh, look at the river access recommendations from previous committee meetings that have also recommended a year-round warning system. Uh, we will need to look for targeting funding for this item, so we have to find funding for that. So, again, it's how we establish that year-round warning system, those red flag days, or however we want to phrase that, uh, formalize that process. In terms of signage, have both the Bureau of Engineering and Planning Department. They're researching signage and wayfinding, and I would like the information from this report incorporated into the report. Could Bureau of Engineering and Planning combine the reports? That's something I'd like to, to appeal to them so we can have uh, our ability to collapse uh, that information. Um, in addition, the signage report should have funding sources for this effort including but not limited to grants, foundations, state, and federal resources. Um, I, don't, I don't know to what extent we can still approach Measure R when we talk about bike paths and bike corridors and the signage that connects so that we don't have a whole array of little signs everywhere. We can start concentrating where the signs go and not take away from the, what that natural feel that some of these pockets have and make it... Uh, a mini sign area that takes away from that 
that natural experience that we long for. Um, so given what you've recommended and the directives that have been indicated today, hopefully we'll get more traction and try to achieve the goals you were stating in terms of how we can get to this before the end of this year. Uh, I will strive to achieve that. Um, but every other month, we're still trying to figure out what part of the city is left. Um, <laughs> we're still questioning the core mission of this city. And, uh, and, and it's, 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 it's just, it's gallows humor, but it, it's what we're facing right now, and it's, and it's very, very tough. But we will continue pushing forward. That's what I figured LaBange and Weezer got laid off. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm a former federal employee, worked uh, for the Secretary of Interior during the Carter administration. I can remember a couple of these when all of a sudden there was no money for coming out of Congress for a series of programs, and I know how frustrating that can that can be. But it's, uh, well, I, I strongly have a uh, I have a strong sense of, of optimism in that. A lot has been achieved in a very short period of time, relatively speaking, oh, yeah. to the need of how long we've neglected the river. And so I, th I strongly feel that we have a lot of energy out there that is not relying on just city resources. And that's coming to fruition. And so we're going to keep pushing so that we can create those, those venues, if you will, and those avenues of, of uh, consensus building and, and keep pushing and establish this policy. Yeah. The, I think that the users are out ahead of the agencies at this point. Well, the demand is definitely there. Yeah. And it's always been there. It's just a matter of how do we formalize it. So that being I, I, said, I thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. as a 35-year a user of the river, I guess initially it was probably wasn't entirely legal. But uh, <laughs> uh, the, just my compliments, the improvements have been fantastic. I mean, it's just all the difference in the world between now and 1980. Well, it's a tremendous family, city family. We have tremendous teamwork, and I give them all the credit. Thank you so much. Okay, anybody here for public comment on this item? Seeing none, item number two. Thank you very much. Number two, BOE, CRA, and Planning Department report relative to Los Angeles River-related projects. Great. You guys welcome. There's three microphones. You can come on up. There's room for everybody here. Good afternoon, folks. It's 3.35, so <laughs> Monday, we'll be okay. All right, go for it. All right, um, um, Larry Shu. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councilman. sir. I'm um, giving the uh, regular BOE uh, update on the, um, from the LA River Project Office at the Bureau of Engineering. Um, really, uh, a lot of these are just a few highlighted items. Uh, the River Cooperation Committee, we are continuing to meet uh, staff level to work on the master use agreement and we're preparing for our next quarterly meeting in April uh, the next meeting of the River Cooperation Committee where we'll be considering another couple of projects and, and uh, other items Great. Um, the core uh, study um, we've had a series of meetings where we've reduced the number of alternatives from 33 to 19 um, this is a big deal uh, for us because it, it really saves a lot of work because um, each of those alternatives um, need to be analyzed in detail according to the core. Huh. So the more we can cut, the better and, and move the, you know, the study forward. Great. Um, that gets us to quicker results, correct? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. And co cost less, too, to do Great. that. Um, in the area of the projects, uh, North Outwater Park Expansion and Creek Restoration is still ongoing. It's in construction. Uh, project teams have been struggling with a couple of uh, geotechnical issues um, that where they run into more boulders than anticipated in the uh, boulders? creek bed. Yeah. Really? So um, they're trying to work through that in terms of negotiating that with the uh, contractor and the cost of you know, addressing that. Uh, the river's a mighty opponent, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, and that's just a creek. Yeah, that's, that's just the, a creek. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Sunny Nook uh, River Park project, uh, we are still uh, waiting for the architectural division to continue revising the design. They haven't um, gotten to that yet, so we're waiting for that to happen. Um, something that's not included in my written report is the uh, uh, West Valley Bikeway Greenway project in Council District 3. Um, they've scheduled a, a groundbreaking um, on March 10th at 2.30. The location is uh, to, be, to be determined. Great. 
That is a um, fantastic one phase of a $36 million project um, to construct about two miles of bikeway on the south side of the river between Van Alden and Mason. And I want to th thank Councilman Reyes for attending our um, river update meeting on um, February uh, 10th, in the evening. That was fun. Uh, it was good. We had uh, 60 people attend. Full house. Yeah. That was a cold night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was really nice. That went well. Um, I want to uh, also talk about something else we've been working on, the um, a revocable right of entry for river river tours. This is uh, kind of on topic with the with, uh, Fuller's earlier presentation, um, we we were approached by the um, someone wanting to to uh, conduct educational tours, and and again just repeating what Lewis said that uh, the letters the 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 Army Corps letter of non-objection for allowing the tours was um, um, had a condition where they wanted they needed um, permission from the city, the underlying fee owner, um, to conduct these tours. So we we talked within BOE, did some investigation, find out who actually controls the property, and we uh, came to the conclusion that a lot of entities have some control over the property, but as far as the city is concerned, uh, we have um, underlying fee ownership of the property, and we decided that a re revocable right of entry would be the appropriate uh, vehicle to um, give permission to that group. So we... Um, Where would that come from? That would come, well, it's... According to the city uh, charter, it's it's under the jurisdiction of the um, Department of Public Works, but and B BOE um, has the responsibility, the you know real estate group, and and Gary Moore has has, has the authority to um, give permission for infrastructure related pro properties, and this this would you know the the ramps at the um, river access ramps at the Rail Seco uh, at Avenue 19 and at uh, Sixth Street Bridge would, would fall into that category. Interesting. Yeah. So Dr. Armstrong will have on a window near her desk pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. All right, so we're finally connecting a, a name and a face with the actual process, so we're getting a little bit closer then. Yeah. It's not formalized yet, but that's still in, a very, in very general terms is what you're saying. Um, well, we, we, have, a, on the we have a draft of, of that right of entry. That's um, the motion that and, and who are you? is going, uh, Lupe Vela, <laughs> right, policy okay. director for the Ad Hoc River Committee. Just for the record. <laughs> it's going to council tomorrow, uh, the motion that's uh, authorizing the city attorney to pr give out um, a revocable um, right of entry. So it'll be going to council tomorrow. And that's something we should share with our advocates in terms of how we begin to publicize and educate uh, the public in engaging the river corridor and how you get that permit. Uh, we had that group from uh, Canada who came in a week or so ago, and you know they were like wayward folks trying to find their way through the darkness, and uh, they ended up getting escorted out anyway. Uh, but maybe a lot of that we could we could uh, prevent. So, thank you for that. Thank you. That concludes our report. Okay. One last thing, and uh, in terms of our, our bridges and impact, given the budget issue, in terms of timelines, um, that's something I would like to request from Mr. Moore or or your your shop in terms of the bridges that interface with the river. Okay, the, the impacts of the budget to the bridge program? Right. Okay. Uh, in terms of deadlines and uh, changes in schedules, if any, and just to get a better sense of what's in the horizon given all our um, the turbulence that we're in right now. Okay, Thank we'll you. bring it back. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great. It's Claire Bowen with the regular report for the Los Angeles Department of City Planning. I don't have a lot to update beyond the report that we provided to your um, to the committee, but I just I did want to take the time to, to thank 
the councilman for coming out to the meeting at the Franklin High School um, the end of January to meet and with all the students who participate in the National Park Recreation. They were um, amazing. They were, they were amazing. And the, the feedback I got from the, the teachers who conducted that program is the students were absolutely thrilled to have you there and that they took the time to really visit and listen to every single one of them. I think that really helped the students feel that their work was appreciated and really will, will, will live on. So I wanted to thank what you. What struck me was their sophistication and being able to move technology, I mean, the, the printed materials, the levels of analysis, the historic counts, uh, where, where they went to visit, you know, it was just amazing. And these were 11th and 12th graders? They were all 12th graders who are going to be graduating this year. Yeah. Wow. And the wow, nice thing is the scary. <laughs> <laughs> they were really amazing. Well, and that the the teachers are interested in actually continuing the program next year and um, the National Park Service and planning are working now with the state parks to start to end with um, the professor Fabian Weigermeister from UCLA to start to think about how we could actually okay. then find opportunities to share these trails with the community um, through either electronic media or other kinds of of information so hopefully that, that information really that is actually Maybe, I don't know if we can do this, Lupe, but maybe capture some of the historic facts that they uh, uncovered, and perhaps we should have it on a website. There's a lot of interesting information that came out uh, regarding the, that whole corridor. Um, and I keep emphasizing that if we could instill a greater sense of identity and self-esteem in our kids because they understand the history of it, then perhaps the whole gang issue is not as as relevant or as important as it is to them at that stage in their life. And these high school students you know, made me aware, wow, that they found out a lot more than I ever anticipated. They learned really a lot, cool. and they were really excited to learn about their community. And I think they yeah. made them really feel really proud of their community, right. which was really exciting. And they also then obviously pointed out a lot of things that we have to fix. So right. <laughs> they well, were, yeah, they're constituents too. Yeah, no, <laughs> but it was helpful for them to, I mean, I think for students to understand what the process is and how you get your voice heard right. um, and who kind of, who makes up a community and how you get things changed was really important for them to learn. So. I want to thank you and the rest of the city family for being part of that because I, I believe that was part of the nurturing that occurred there is that professionals like yourselves were there and able to engage them and you know, my staff that was there too. I appreciate that very, very much. Well, it was, your, it was, it was Jill Soriel from your staff who really encouraged us to actually originally go after this grant, so I want to thank her and acknowledge that for her role right, in that. Jill. And I'll, I'll, work, I'll work with Lupe to see how we can get the information that we have. We do have some of those students um, work electronically, so we can start to see how we can kind of pull that out. And That's Fabian's good. groups, Fabian students are going to be geocoding all of the places along each of those trails, there might be opportunity again to link some of that to our website. Wonderful. Great. And I guess the only other quick update I have is that we do um, have a date now for the bicycle plan going to council tomorrow. So just for the record. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, full steam ahead there. Yes. Well, good work. Good work. Thank you. Uh, sir. Jason Neville, CRA. Um, Going to report to you on the Northeast LA project area that's proposed as well as the CASP. But first, I want to give you an update on the governor's proposal to eliminate the three relevant agencies. Um, and also, it sounds like tomorrow there's a packed committee, uh, council agenda. Also on the agenda is an item to transfer um, projects from, to do a cooperation agreement with the city to um, regarding some, many of the CRA's projects um, in the event that redevelopment agencies are eliminated as currently proposed in the budget. Um, I went through with the River Corporation staff the, that list of projects, and there's about 20, 21 projects, CRA projects in the River Corridor, totaling about $90 million that are included in that list. That would be a part of the cooperation agreement that is item, uh, that's tomorrow at Council. So I um, want to give you an update on that. The redevelopment agency in Los Angeles, as well as um, agencies throughout California, are hard at work to tell the story of redevelopment and the work that we're doing in the communities and how important it is. Right. Um, things are changing by the day. Right. Um, but I um, want to give you an update on, no, no, on that and answer that. any questions that you might have. Well, I'm just hoping that uh, eventually, well, I shouldn't say eventually, it ha has to happen pretty quick, that uh, the language we keep using is about cutting and cutting. And uh, in that process, I'm afraid when we start cutting off, we'll start cutting off the, the right hand that allows us to generate revenue. And I think the redevelopment agency, in many instances, has been able to prove that worth 
and establish that value. It's just that we, how we amplify that incremental difference that expands the general revenue pie mm -hmm. is what we're not hearing. Right. So I'm hoping that maybe tomorrow's discussion uh, we can isolate, have case examples of how the presence of the redevelopment agency's role has actually expanded our capacity to address the very same issues that the governor claims is being hurt. So in other words, the larger the pie, the more revenue, the more jobs, the less reason for people to be on welfare or having to be subsidized for child care and or affecting their educational programs because our revenue is being generated and being leveraged. See, I'm not hearing that part of the story, and we have to amplify that. I speak to it, but I can only use examples in my district. If it wasn't for the CRA, I wouldn't have this mixed-use facility that created jobs, that has housing, that kept people from being homeless, that did not need social welfare and or county health services because people are becoming healthier, they're in their home, and they're not living in the street. I, mean, I can demonstrate that over and over again in different locations in my district. We but have a team that is crafting those those different stories to tell, and that's a really good point. I'm going to make sure that they... Yeah, I, I, and then what you're doing for the River Corporation, without your support, we wouldn't have the current staff, and, and we need to start leveraging the opportunity that is the River Corridor right. so we can build income streams for maintenance, for physical change, and all that other good stuff. So we, we I appreciate that. We have contacted, or I should say that the River Corporation staff has contacted the state house and assembly members along the river right. and, and voiced their support for redevelopment and um, is doing that as well. So as keeping that in mind, some of the activities that we have undergoing, that we're doing in Northeast LA, um, further activities in Northeast LA have been postponed. That's further activities. The activities that have already been um, contracted, um, so the field surveys, um, the historic resources survey, those are, that is, that continues. Um, we've already received the applications for the, um, the steering committee, the community advisory committee for the area. So the council offices, I believe that's four and 13, will be reviewing those applications. Um, and also, as I think you know, the CRA received a $2.25 million grant from HUD Sustainable Communities Planning Grant, and um, CRA staff is hoping that that grant can continue forward, the, the sustainable planning work and the work to develop for right. HUD will go forward, no matter, even if we are uh, eliminated. In your district, the CASC redevelopment plan um, is continuing, although some things are, we're going to take a wait and see approach. We it pushed back the date for the applications for the CAC to March 18th. Um, we, every house, including every residence in William Mead, was given a CAC application. We had a, some good conversations with folks in the neighborhood and in William Mead. It was it was nice. So hopefully right. there'll be broad representation on the CAC. EIR with Claire is going forward. Um, CRA continues to meet with property owners, institutional property owners, about opportunity sites and city departments. California High Speed Rail is releasing its draft alignments on March 3rd, which will could significantly impact CAS. We're um, waiting for that. And um, further blight analysis is on hold until the state budget issue is resolved in that area. Gotcha. So that's our update. Well, there's a lot there. So hang in there. I know it's kind of hard to keep moving forward when you have this big old... I, I already um, asked Lewis McAdams if Fuller was hiring, so I'm trying to... Okay, hold on. <laughs> Stay in the River family. <laughs> you want to give us a summary of your resume? More <laughs> gallows humor here, but well, thank you, sir. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Um, and then we could just note and file uh, the reports. And looking forward to Mr. Regan's uh, written report. Uh, we're hoping he can get us that because I know uh, this, the Rec and Park staff, and thank you. Uh, those that are working on the Alley River, uh, especially on the whole boating issue. And, and I know you're working hard, so I appreciate your work. And so I'm looking forward to Mr. Regan's uh, written report. Uh, and that will be in the end of April. We have uh, item three to follow. Right. Uh, 
So we have, uh, thank you very much. You want to read item three to the record? Number three, Department of Rec and Parks provide an update in response to motion to raise Car City Cardinals LaBonge relative to the feasibility of establishing a pilot non motorized boating program. Good afternoon, sir. John Kapitsky, Aquatic Director from Reckon Parks, and I'm here with your very brief update on the non-motorized boating program. So I think we have identified our initial site for the pilot program, and after uh, having taken some walking tours with Lupe and having done some both um, walking tours and some boating activity on the river, um, I put together a, a recommendation summary that I've given to the senior management of Reckon Parks so they have that i'm confident that's going to form the foundation for the report that mr regan is going to submit right uh, i've also spoken to uh, some people within rec and parks we're trying to identify a secure storage site for the equipment that would be used in the program and then also trying to uh, they're assisting me with some of the right-of-way issues that will be involved with getting the boats literally physically getting them into the river okay and then I've been assigned to, to make myself available to uh, provide whatever assistance in terms of the program, whether that be on site or um, assisting <coughs> Mr. Regan. So they've kind of designated me to uh, be available at all times. So I think in summary, we have a good handle on what the program should look like. So that part of it is, I think, becoming very clear. I think the coming question is the who of the program. Right. And that's that's out in front of us. Um, so I, I, that, that's really it in a nutshell. I think okay. there's a good sense of what, what this should look like, what it should right. be. Uh, there are some things to work out. I think that the, from the previous uh, people that have spoken, there's, uh, from a lifeguard's perspective, my perspective, all of these, the issues, the legal issues that uh, come before getting on the water, that's something that I kind of leave to them but I think once we can get there and get in um, we know what what needs to be done we know how to do it we know you know what it's going to be required to, to be in terms of equipment that will be provided okay so all those things are coming clear I think that's pretty yeah. much Mr. Kapinski I wanted to just ask you one question when we look at establishing a pilot non-motorized boating program in the river um, could you say, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but, but could you say that when we begin to cultivate this approach, that perhaps some of the issues that were raised in item one mm -hmm. about access and targeted areas, um, do you think that progress you're making that we could glean off of your observations, some of the more pragmatic issues when it comes to this point of access, because it is about safety, right. and your equipment is about safety, and, right. and you are defining space that enhances that, 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 that boating experience, but with it comes all these other ancillary issues. Is, to what degree do you think there's an overlap? I mean, just shooting from the hip kind of thing. Well, I was, I was very much in agreement with some of the things that I heard described earlier. I think the concept of um, an online contact point, uh, now that would probably be in, the, in a non-commercial vein for the casual user or the recreational user. I think that that could be easily established and I think it could be, um, it could be done in a way that it could allow uh, it could still protect the liability of the city, but it could also inform and kind of control the use of by the recreational user. Um, we have a pretty good history in the department, too, of permitting. In other words, we have a very uh, thorough process for permitting, and I think if, if uh, it could be cloned or it could be um, at least examined for the value that it could bring. Right. So. I do think that there is a prospect in the initial stages when it becomes more publicly aware that people can use the river, uh, that it will generate more interest, and that that initially there may be some of that kind of un, you know unauthorized, uncontrolled use. But I think that the I think that there's some been been some really good thought that's gone into how this could be done and right. the risks that are involved. But I know that 
they've thought about it. And I've really heard a lot of things today that I thought were, were on point. Uh, to what degree, um, another concern I have is the, the state of the natural habitats. You know, we see uh, wildlife in there. We see the egrets and the gray heron. And in the preventing process, uh, just given your experience, do we also regulate for the, the levels of impact that is imposed upon the natural habitats? Because it's there, does it mean a person should be there given the sensitivity of those environments? I don't, I don't really see us, you know, and you said shoot from the hip, I don't yeah. see a significant environmental impact from kayaking. Uh, in the time that I've worked in the, the Sepulveda Basin for several years, uh, I, what I've seen is that as the, it, as the river becomes uh, a flood control channel, as it really literally fills up, you know, and we've got this rapid flow, um, that environment is altered every storm. And it's, it's very different after each of those storms. So, I, and I wouldn't, I'm not suggesting that it's uh, a healing process. It's quite to the contrary. There's significant erosion. Uh, there's debris that's washed into the river that is kind of uh, can be trapped there in some respects. So those are probably far more significant impacts on that environment than anything from a kayaker. Uh, gotcha. it's, it's, you know, you go into the river or you just observing from, from for example, Lake Balboa from that park, you'll see the plastic bags 30 feet up in the tree line, you know, from where the water has, has risen. So I see that as being the more significant impact rather than the cocky. I just don't see that being uh, detrimental in any way. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I appreciate uh, your hard work, and um, I'm hoping that Mr. Regan does come, that we have that report written, and then we can review it and analyze it as we go through it. Um, in terms of uh, questions, we have um, when do you think the report will be completed if our, if our goal is to be up and kayaking by the end of April? Uh, what I've done is I, I've, as I said, I provided to him last week a summary of all the recommendations that I made and it went, just to give you a little idea of what it talked about was how the what the structure of the program would be what it might look like what equipment would be needed um, depending on who the provider is I just feel that there needs to be a little bit of work up front almost like a checklist do you recognize that it will require the following items because some of them are significant in terms of cost and I mean it's going to take a trailer that will hold these boats it will take a vehicle to tow the trailer you know, and these things are available, but it's not a casual undertaking. I mean, it has to be done with some thought to make this, uh, you know, a viable program. So I forwarded all of that to him. He had seen a draft version of that previously, probably a good month ago, and I know that it's been received by his office, and so I don't foresee a problem with him. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised to see that they have that largely completed in the next week or two. So I don't, I don't see a problem with that timeline at all. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other thoughts or anything uh, you'd like to share? Nope. I'm just uh, appreciate your time, and and I think I'm echoing the sentiments of everybody. I know we have a difficult circumstance to work under, but we're trying to uh, provide answers and provide service. Continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Kabinsky. Thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to so continue? That, do you want to continue? Yeah, we should continue this. Let me make sure we get the, uh, the reports in. Thank you, sir. All right, but anyone for public comment on this item? No. Seeing none. Okay, so in conclusion, we can go through the announcements. And um, the Mayor's Alley River Day of Service is scheduled for Saturday, April 30th, which happens to be the same day as the Gran Impresa. So we'll be leveraging resources and people, I assume.
sort of see it as Kobe versus Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> so as Mr. McAdams stated, there is a challenge to the, the Urban River Challenge with Chicago. Yeah. And we're going to see who can bring out the most number of people and who can build up the biggest ball of plastic. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we can send it to them. <laughs> they can recycle. Yeah, but we have 33 miles of a river, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What? Well, Ali not being an underdog is not. That's not uncommon. So that's good. <laughs> So that is April 30th, and on the uh, second at a River Revitalization Corporation's next board meeting, and Omar is here with us. Good to see Omar. Uh, their board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, March 16th at the Mayor's Press Room in City Hall. The River Revitalization Corporation is the real estate arm of the River Revitalization team, working closely with City County River Co uh, Cooperation Committee. River Office of the Bureau of Engineering, all Riverly, and this committee. So good to see you, Omar. And that is on March 16th, correct? And number three, we have the River Cooperation Committee on April 4th at 1 p.m. The RCC is a joint working group comprised of the LA County Flood Control District and the City of LA. In conjunction with the United States Army Corps of Engineers, it is part of the three-tier management structure of the River Revitalization Program, in addition to the River Revitalization Corporation and a future foundation. The committee meets to coordinate and evaluate projects along the upper reach of the Los Angeles River. And finally, we have the LA County Bicycle Coalition's annual river ride. That's on June 5th. Over 2,000 riders participate in a variety of rides from a kid's ride to a century 100 miles ride. And last but not least is the Ad Hoc River Committee. Next meeting will be April 25th. So we will not be having a meeting in March, but we will on April 25th. Uh, anybody here for public comment for the overall agenda? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.